Welcome. We're here today to talk about 360 Rain because it's really been an exciting few weeks since we introduced it and uh, we want to tell you about it today. I'm Justin Cook, an innovation engineer at 360 Yield Center and I've been a part of this fun project since it began over a couple years ago. So just to remind ourselves, 360 Rain is an autonomous irrigation system that goes up and down your planter passes all season long putting nutrients right where they belong, both in time and in placement at the root zone throughout the entire season, delivering that million dollar rain as we go throughout the entire season. So I spent a lot of time on Google Earth the last few weeks because we asked all the growers that had interest in this to send in their field and we we're mapping fields and just seeing uh, how our system fits into their fields. And We've, we've pulled away a few good lessons and we just want to come back to you and share what we're learning as we start uh, mapping specific fields and talking to growers about the 360 range system. It can really be summarized into four areas of learning that we've come across. The first one is there's just limited water. Um, one of the first questions we're asking when a person submits their fields is do you have water underneath your field. And what's been really encouraging with 360 rain is that it actually needs much less water than the typical irrigation systems. And so the answer is yes, far, off, far more often than it would be with a pivot system. So whether it's for um, regulatory purposes that the water is limited or if it is because just your region doesn't have enough uh, water underneath it to produce the flows you need, um, 360 rain works well in, in, in those areas. And the reason that we can live with less water is because there's no evaporative losses and we're placing the water right into the root zone area and we're also able to distribute that water prescriptively throughout the whole field so that the places that have good water holding capacity are given less water than the places that have poor water holding capacity. And so we can take that same amount of gallons or less gallons and we can produce a crop. Also, a lot of the places where we're finding that 360 has enough, 360 rain has enough water are also uh, regions that have decent water holding capacity soils. So they just don't need 10, 12, 15 inches of water inch acres per year. They can live on three to four to five and that's where we specialize. So that limited water. The second one is just field shape. We'll show you this, but there really is no limitation of where we can and can't go. If, if the planter can go into an area to plant that field, it's likely, and we'll show you some examples, that we can take 360 rain down that same exact path where the planter went, and so we can get into the nooks and crannies of fields and go places that just a pivot cannot go. And thirdly, just as we talked a little bit about it, this whole idea to apply prescriptively as we see a lot of soil variation, both in nutrients and in water, we can, um, we can deliver prescriptively. Because as we go down, we're 60 feet wide, and as we go in and out of different zones of, of uh, different soil types, doing prescription is, is as simple as speeding up and slowing down. It's really quite simple on how we deliver prescriptions. And then last one, and this is becoming a really high level of interest in these growers, and that is for the guys that have manure. It's a very stressful um, problem that they carry on. How do I distribute my manure and how do I get it um, pumped in, in that very narrow window of time, either at the end of fall or at the beginning of spring? It's really high stress and it's expensive. We're paying a penny a gallon to uh, a penny and a half per gallon, gallon and these livestock operations operate in the millions of gallons. So it's a, it's a real expense. And so we think there's an envir environmentally friendly aspect of this, of, of putting it down the nutrients um, in a place right where it's gonna get immediately sucked up into the plant and the nutrients are not gonna go down the river and it just takes a lot of the stress off of having to get it all done in a week or two. So let's look at this first topic of limited water. This is a, a water availability, groundwater availability map for the state of Indiana. 
and I'm pretty fresh with this because I just drove across Interstate 80 this past uh, Sunday coming home from, from being out in Northeast Indiana and I was coming across 80 and if you'll, you'll look at this map, the different colors correspond to different amounts of gallons per minute for the different parts of the state. So up in near the north side, you'll see, you'll, north part of the state, you see the blue and the dark green. That's a thousand and a six hundred gallons a minute water availability. And as I drove across that part of the state, you see pivots everywhere. There's just where there where there's a where they can fit one in. They they are there because the water's there and irrigation pays. But as you get to other places of the state, now we get down to 400, 200, or 100 gallons a minute, and you just don't see any center pivots in those locations. We think that that's a really a great opportunity for 360 rain because that's all we need. So you can see it opens up a lot of the state of Indiana for, for irrigation. Similar sorts of things with Ohio. Um, down at the, at the bottom corner there, you see the map. This is Madison County in Ohio. And the blue, actually the non-yellow areas, are places where you can get between 100 to 500 gallons a minute. And then the yellow down the corner of that county is a limestone area that you can only get up to 100 gallons a minute. So I've taken all those county maps and I've taken superimposed it onto the map of Ohio. Kind of see Lake Erie up there to the north, but this is the northwest corner of Ohio where you have most of the farm ground in Ohio. And you'll see that everything that's outlined with blue has enough capacity to run 360 rain, but not enough to run a pivot. With the exception of just up here in the, the east part of this county and down along Dayton, along the river, that's one of the few areas in Ohio where they have enough water to sustain a center pivot. Similar story for with Wisconsin. Down here at the bottom, you see the darkest green shade of green. That's where they can get 1,000 gallons a minute. And then as you go up further north, you get into those lighter shades of green of 600 and 400 and, and even down to 100 gallons a minute. So with, 300, with 360 rain, there's like two and a half times more acres that can be watered with our system than if you're going to be running a center pivot. So a lot of opportunity for growers to get into irrigation that really never could have considered it before, and we're seeing that. As we talk to growers, that's their storyline. We just uh, we couldn't have entertained uh, the idea of, of irrigation before this came along. Okay, so now let's just look at some of the fields and, and the individual fields and just talk through the process of laying them out and designing them. Uh, let me explain, first of all, just what you see in this picture, some of these red lines and yellow thumbtacks. The yellow thumbtack is where we place the hydrant. That's the place that's going to have electrical power. It's going to have uh, our water supply. It's probably going to have a booster pump. And it's where we, where we hook up the rain unit hose and uh, electricity. And from there, this, this unit will, will head off perpendicular to the planting direction, which the planting direction in this field is, is parallel to this AB line down here. And then we'll get to the edge and then head along parallel up the row and then lay down hose as we go. And then when we get to the end, then we'll pull the hose back up and we'll come back down and we'll back up towards the well. We'll do a 90 degree turn and then we'll turn and go the opposite direction and then come back, and then we'll get and we'll head back to the well again. We'll increment over 60 feet, and then we'll head back parallel down the path. So that's how um, the, the motion looks for one half of the field. Then as we work our way closer and closer to the, to the hydrant, then what we do is we back into the hydrant and then turn 90 degrees to the right and go out, and now we start covering the other half of the field in the same way. So in this particular application, these red lines help me to know where to place the hydrant. In this case, it's a, a previous irrigation application. So I just, it worked out to put it where the, where the, the hydrant already exists for the, the irrigation system. But um, to reach all the corners using this as my hydrant, it required uh, 2,500 feet of hose. So I, that's the two main questions that this whole layout is. Um, where do I put the hydrant and how long of a hose do I need to, to uh, sell you in, other, in order to be able to cover 99, greater than 99% of the field? 
So in this particular case, it's a 130 acre field. I needed a 2,500 foot hose to get me to the all four corners. And what we've found is that we have the capacity to go up to 2,900 feet. We've limited ourselves on that just from the gross vehicle weight starts to get high and the pressure drop starts to become really expensive in terms of how much water flow we can get as we go longer. So with this 2,500 foot hose right, operating at uh, a boost pressure of uh, say 115 to 120 PSI, that's about all the higher we want to take it because of just the hose strength itself. But when we boost up that high, then over 2,500 feet, we can push 200 gallons a minute through that hose. That'll be less if the hose is longer, and it will be more if the hose is shorter because the pressure drop per 100 feet is, is smaller, or is, it goes up with, with the flow rates. So this is 2,500 feet. We're, we're able to get 200 gallons a minute, and on 130 acres, that winds up being just over half an inch of water coverage per week. Again, um, you'll see that this has different soil types. So again, we have the ability to speed up and slow down over the, the, the soils that have good or poor water holding capacity. Also, this field was irrigated, and until they built those houses there on the, the east part of, the, of the, uh, the irrigation path, it was a full circle, but now they're only able to cover 80 acres of this field, and it's 130. And with rain, we expect to cover the full 130 uh, acres. This is another example of just good land utilization of, of dry land versus irrigated. That this pivot's a four tower, it's a 700 foot um, uh, pivot, and it's covering 45 acres out of a field that is purchased at 81 acres. And once again, 360 range should have no trouble at all uh, covering this entire 81 acres. And just to get, kind of amplify that a little bit, this is just zooming out from that particular field, and you can see lots of pivots in this area. Uh, this is South Carolina, and there's just, a, a, it's got rich with water, but the field geometry of, of that part of the country just is very unfriendly to pivots. So we think that we're going to have a good opportunity with 360 rain to come in there, and the fields are not that large, the water is readily available, and we should be able to put ample amounts of water on those fields and get 100% utilization. So I want to talk a little bit more about soil, soil variability. This is a field out in uh, just um, west of Columbus, Ohio, and it's uh, 400 acres. You can be, see a little bit more soil variability in this, but uh, their, their agronomist takes those zones and actually puts them into crop production indexes. And so you can see this field has huge variability um, and this is, as I hear from the, the growers I talk to in Ohio, this is quite typical to see this level of variability. So to have a 60-foot bar that can speed up and slow down on those polygons can be really uh, valuable. And uh, just to stretch this a, a little bit on terms of uh, the size and shapes of fields that we can do, this is down in um, Georgia. And as you can see, there's a lot of irrigation ground, a lot of uh, pivots in that area. But when you come to this field, it's got over 200 acres and seven parcels, and it just there's no way that you can clear enough ground out of the way and clear enough of the trees to, to make a pivot work. So we, I just asked him, would you be able to clear out some of the, um, the trees, not, not the, the whole trees between fields, but just some places for the 360 rain unit to get through? And, uh, so I'm going to try to explain some of these red lines and the green and orange boxes, but um, this is where we've, we designed the, the hydrant so he could build a well and, and if he wants to, to have several uh, hydrants that are being uh, serviced with that well. But from there, um, if he would clear out this area right in here with a 120 foot wide strip that we can just drive through as a road to get from one field to the next, then we can set up our 50-yard line here and go north and south. We can go up here and, and go whatever the planting direction is, we can cover this whole field and uh, get rid of some of these trees, get a clearing down here, come down and cover most of this field. So it's really interesting just how with this system, if, if we can create roads between fields, if we know where your planter went, we can build our backbone, and then we can go down and cover 
Um, very odd shaped parcels that aren't even joined together as long as we can just get some kind of a bridge to connect them. So it gives you some idea of what capacity and creativity we can uh, exhibit with 360 rain and, and, and farm a acres that just are not feasible in any other way to get to. Okay, so fourthly we're going to look at manure. And uh, this is a, a real pain point that growers experience of uh, that they have to um, store the manure throughout the whole year and then they have to uh, pay to have it spread and distributed over their ground in a very short time window in the fall, um, maybe a couple weeks, and then maybe a, a little time in the spring where they can be out in their fields distributing manure. So it's a real pain point. So we're just looking at how does that look with 360 rain? How does it look when we take that manure and we inject it into the water stream and run it through our system and, and deposit the manure over 10 weeks or more and put in the manure along the side of water right beside the plant so it's going right up inside, uh, right up inside the plant. So this is a pretty typical uh, application. It's a grower that has three houses, 2,400 each, so there's 7,200 uh, head of swine. They're generating around two and a half to 2.7 million gallons of manure every year. And they want to, from a nutritional perspective, they want to put um, about 4,000 gallons of manure per acre. That's their typical spread rate. So we're just looking at what does that look like uh, with our system. So in order to get those rates with that much manure, they need 675 acres. They've actually got over 800. So we just mapped this out. We laid it out and we thought that um, with five uh, rain machines with 2,900 foot hoses each, we could cover the whole 860 acres. And each of those would be uh, with 2,900 feet. They're going to be flowing at about 185 gallons a minute capacity if we, we run them at full pressure. And we're figuring that the, they have, the rain unit has about 70 days of, of good run time. The crop might take over 100 days, been some rain days, but we figure 70 days. If that, at that pace, he needs to put a little over 7,000 gallons of manure through the rain system every day. And when you run the numbers, it isn't very high. It's only five gallons a minute. So it's a garden hose of manure that's being injected into a fire hose of water. And so the dilution's 2-3% of the manure, and it's going with the water. The beauty of that is, is that, that nutrients alone isn't enough. You need the taxi cab that takes it up into the plant. It's all mass transfer. And so if you have water, along with the nutrients, then you're just giving it the vehicle and you're putting it right into the root zone where the, the, the roots are available to suck it right up and take it up into the plant. So finally, I just want to share my experience. And uh, as I've been uh, mapping these fields and talking to growers, it's really been fun. And, and the main reason is just because whatever a grower says, it's just rare where I don't where I can't say yes. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we could do that. It's just yes, yes, yes. Uh, until one thing happens. They ask me, can I buy one today? And then I have to say no. Um, so I want to just lay that out a little bit about where we're at um, and where we, what our plan to our go to market strategy. Um, we're going to be having a half dozen machines running within a half dozen miles of R&D this, this coming growing season this summer. Uh, we have uh, growers in, in Florida that we're working on the off-season, and we'll have a few machines running down there, one now and, and uh, several uh, coming this fall and next, next spring. And then in 2022, we plan to have dozens of machines, a couple dozen-ish, and those will be very strategically placed, both in, in regions as well as applications what kinds of, of applications that, so that we as engineers can remove all the surprises away from uh, what we would find out the next year. We want to get as much broad breadth of coverage as we can in 2022. So it's a fun project. It's an incredible technology that has uh, enormous potential. So thanks for listening and stay tuned as we grow this business.